This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. A good Monday morning to you, and thanks for joining us here on Real Talk. It's August 22nd. It's Monday, and it's great to be back in studio after uh, a week away on vacation. Coming up today, we're going to be talking to the Titan of Talk, Charles Adler. We've got our regular Monday date with him. And, of course, Senator Paula Simons is going to join us a little bit later on in the broadcast. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. We want to catch up on it. We want to take on some of the top news stories of the week, and we also want to pull back the curtain. We're going to let you know what's going on with us here over the last little while. It's it's been a bit of a gong show behind the scenes, and we think our audience deserves to know exactly why we've been a little bit wonky. We didn't have a show last Friday, like I'm talking 10 days ago when we meant to. We're not live on YouTube this morning. If you're hearing this on the podcast, you don't know any different. It will make no difference to you, but we've got that hardcore group that joins us, our Real Talkers, live every weekday morning at 8.30 Mountain, 10.30 Eastern, and, and interruptions from our service providers have uh, made life very difficult for us and you deserve to know exactly why that's happening the silver lining for us the exciting uh sort of the look forward for us is that we've got a new studio where construction is almost complete and these are going to be challenges that will be behind us they will be left in the dust when we depart this our studio 1.0 and we're really excited about that i hope you can hear the smiling in my voice i hope you can see the smiling on my face if you're watching this on youtube it is is all masking pure bubbling anxiety shared by John Hicks and myself, John, the technical producer of this show. You have been troubleshooting like a boss, and I've never been more proud of you, pal. How was the week away from the studio? Did you have some time to relax? Did you have some time to chill out? Until this morning, it was quite relaxing, Ryan, <laughs> yes. But uh, that new studio can't come soon enough. I, I love you, and I appreciate you, and we're going to be getting into the stories that people care about. Inclu- what about... Lisa LaFlamme's unceremonious departure Crazy. from CTV's national newscast. This is mind boggling. And we're going to talk about this with both of our guests today, Charles Adler and Senator Paula Simons. That's coming up. And then tomorrow, we're going to be talking to national political columnists, probably the most well known political columnist in the country, I would say. Andrew Coyne will join us. And I'm curious to know his take on that as well. How is he wrapping his mind around the manner in which Lisa LaFlamme's career was ended by bean count? After 35 years, including the last 10, as their, of course, nightly news anchor uh, on one of the most watched national newscasts in the country. That's coming up in just a little bit. Of course, Pierre Poliev continues to gain momentum. I know Chuck's going to want to talk about a new video of his coming up in just a few minutes. What are some of the other big stories that broke over the last while? I mean, Canadian journalists, in particular women, in particular women of color, continue to receive heinous messages, threats of violence. There's a hit list going around, and this is something that we're paying very close attention to as well and talking to some of the people directly affected by that. Now, several of the guests that we had lined up to come on the show and talk about it have since, and we're obviously not going to say who it is. It doesn't matter, and they are well within their rights. And as a matter of fact, this goes this goes well beyond that. I can't imagine walking a mile in the shoes of, that they're walking in right now, but some guests that we've had lined up have said, hey, listen, since we agreed to come on the show, some things have developed, some things have happened, and it's getting worse and worse, and quite frankly, they don't want to put themselves in the line of fire, metaphorically or otherwise, and so they're not going to do interviews publicly to talk about it. This is a real threat, not only to many people's personal safety, people that are that are professionals that are doing an important job here, the fourth estate across the country, but also in the bigger picture of how we manage uh, some of the correspondence here received by people, in particular women that continue to face these types of threats of violence. Where are the police in this? What are the roles that newsrooms need to play? Senator Simons, an award-winning journalist, before she started serving her fellow Canadians in the Red Chamber, has some experience with this, and we're going to talk to her about this coming up in just a little bit. Charles Adler joins us in 90 seconds, but first, I want to let you know about Apex Automation. They've been putting out the call to engineers across the country. They're looking for the best and brightest. They're looking for engineers that right now maybe aren't feeling the type of career fulfillment you need to keep on working away for that company that maybe doesn't totally value your contributions. 
You want to achieve great things. You want to reach your full potential. You want to see the same for your clients. Why not reach out to Apex Automation? You can check out the careers link on their website, Apex Automation's website. You can link to all of those under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge want to remind you that it's always a great time to shop for your next vehicle from the convenience of your own home. That's right, at SherwoodDodge.com, StAlbertDodge.com. You can browse Alberta's best selection of Jeep, Ram, and of course that great Dodge lineup. You're looking to pull something, you know, maybe you got a new trailer or a boat, or maybe you're looking to downsize based on fuel costs. Their teams are ready to help you out at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. And a big shout out to our friends at Local Environmental. Johnny, you know I'm seeing more and more of their green bins popping up in the neighborhoods around us. It's great to see their footprint growing. And that's the case across Alberta and Saskatchewan. People value that local family-owned approach to waste and recycling management. But of course, they're way more than that too. Portable toilets, water hauling, fencing, and more. You can check them out online. Local Environmental Services. And don't forget, they proudly present Trash Talk every Friday. Friday, right here on the show. Well, it's one of the things we look forward to every single week on Mondays. The RTDNA Lifetime Achievement Award winning, Emmy Award winning, legendary talk host Charles Adler makes time for us. Chuck repping his real talk snap back cap. My man, a week off. It feels like we haven't spoken with you for ages. How have you been? Where did we find you from today? Where are you at? In uh, British Columbia today, oh, uh, Ryan. But, you know, I'm thinking about... I'm thinking about the business, about local, and of course, I, I love all your sponsors for doing what they do. Most important, I love them because without them, that we, we can't be doing this. But how do I think local when I when I seems like I'm in a different town every ten minutes? <laughs> I live the life of a of a gypsy. I don't know how to think local. I just think national all the time. And nationally, the story that's still creating buzz, despite uh, how some guys may feel about it, and they, you know they get they get tired of a particular a powerful woman getting this much attention. But that being said. Uh, Lisa Laflamme, I just don't think that Bell was doing any thinking. Uh, years ago, Jay Leno had Hugh Grant on, and Hugh Grant had a, 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 a an incident. Yeah, okay? Divine a, Brown, a, yeah. A, yeah, a really, a really a difficult, a scandalous incident. And, of course, uh, he was uh, married to somebody who was considered uh, one of the most beautiful women in the world, Elizabeth Hurley. And so <laughs> Grant takes his seat on The Tonight Show, and Jay Leno just looks at him and says, what were you thinking? Yeah, and that, I've got the Jay Leno question for Bell, and I know that we got Bell executives and and people who are piped into the executives. What the hell were you thinking, Charles? For people, uh, and I don't know how many are left because her Twitter video, Lisa Laflamme's Twitter video, is already it's closing in on five million views. By the time some people hear this on the podcast, it'll probably already be there. We won't roll the full two minutes, but but here are some snippets of the video posted to Twitter by Lisa Laflamme. I felt you should hear this directly from me. On June 29th, I was informed that Bell Media made a quote, business decision to end my contract, bringing to a sudden close my long career with CTV News. I was blindsided and am still shocked and saddened by Bell Media's decision. At 58, I I still thought I'd have a lot more time to tell more of the stories that impact our daily lives. Instead, I leave CTV humbled by the people who put their faith in me to tell their story. I I guess this is my sign off from CTV. So I want to express my deepest gratitude to all of you. While it is crushing to be leaving CTV national news in a manner that is not my choice. Please know reporting to you has truly been the greatest honor of my life. And I thank you for always being there. Now, it's no surprise, Charles, that she kept it classy, uh, but some details have leaked, uh, leading people to have bigger picture conversations about how women in particular are treated in industries like the media. Is this all about Lisa LaFlamme letting her hair go gray? I mean, is it that petty? Uh, Some of it is, but some of it is just basic incompetence. I mean, this is, with all due respect to guys who are mucking the stables, sometimes we used to call them stable boys. I realize you've got women doing the same thing. I I get that. But this is like someone mucking the stables, right, at um, a palace or or a castle perhaps in Scotland, and the guy mucking the stables for some reason 
on a particular day, and nobody understands how this happened, fires the queen. You can't fire the queen. <laughs> I, I know that you, you know you're 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 doing your best, mucking the stables, and you you think you know what you're doing, but you have absolutely no business doing this. If if anybody had thrown out a hypothetical days before this happened, if I said you know Ryan uh, Lisa Laflamme. Uh, you know, um, yeah, she's she's got the the best show in town, and she's got great ratings, and her Q rating is high. I don't want to get into too much industry stuff, but the point is, she's extremely not not just popular. She's extremely popular, not just with women, women, men, you name it, every every demographic there is. But you know what, Ryan? You know, uh, you know, she, you know, she's she's getting she's a couple of years away from sixty. I think CTV may want to you know freshen it up, move, you know, and move on. Ryan, if I were to tell you that just two days before this happened, what would you be telling me? Just give me the most honest, from the hip answer Ryan Jesperson can offer. Well, I, I've got to be honest, though, and, and people will say that uh, perhaps both you and I have a conflict of interest. Or maybe that's not necessarily accurate or not the best way to put it. But but both of us have, have been on the chopping block before in different circumstances. And through a long career in media, you see many people <laughs> oftentimes at the top of their game with great ratings and sold out yeah. shows axed for different reasons, right? <laughs> uh, in this circumstance, it wasn't. Ha, have you heard of circumstances like that? No, I, I have no, I have no idea. No, what you're I, about. I, I Just know, answer, I, answer the bloody I, I, question. I'm trying to, I'm trying if to I think of it. hypothetically Let say, me say this. Laplan, I've Lisa not. Laplan, is about to have an axe in her back two days before it happened. What would you have said to me? I would have said no chance. I would have said no chance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But because? at the same time, Why? I've not, but give, I've give not me, been able to the, understand the, much right. of the decision making process in right. Canadian media as of late, Chuck. Well, okay. I, I understand that you know, all of us have some, some issues with Canadian media, you know, you know, you know get, get guilty as or sin. Media I, I don't want to be, yeah. I don't want to be boring. I don't want to be, I don't want to be blaming other people for the fact that I got, you know, bored shitless in the last few years. I'm sure that you know the, the responsibility is 99 percent mine. I don't, I don't, I don't think I can move forward by by blaming other people and scapegoating. And I'm always down on people in, in social media who spend you know an entire lifetime scapegoating somebody, scapegoating Trudeau, scapegoating Danielle Smith, scapegoating anybody. At some point, you know, you, you you've got a uh, the fiddle has to play a different tune. But the tune on this one, and it just it, you know. It, it just gets stuck on this business of a young guy, a young whippersnapper, if you will, thinking that somehow he's going to make big impact in the industry. He's going to have this elephant-sized footprint if he fires the queen. It's a dumb idea, and it's an idea that's ego-driven. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's about uh, Lisa Laflamme's hair or Lisa Laflamme being 58, which I guess in the, in the mind of a young whippersnapper is the equivalent of a, a male being 78. But that's the largest issue in the land right now that we can focus on. Why is it that a 58-year-old woman is treated like a 78-year-old man? Yeah, well, uh, and and many people will probably argue that that she she was not even uh, given the courtesy of being treated like a 78-year-old man. I mean, I don't I don't think, and and there's no need to like drag Lloyd Robertson into this kicking and streaming. He didn't have anything to do with this kicking and screaming. But like Lloyd Robertson was on the desk until he he could barely sit on the desk anymore. And that's no offense to Lloyd, a long and storied career. I mean, how you want to talk about unfair? How about how about introducing her replacement on the desk the same day that you let Canadians know that she's being axed without a chance to even say goodbye? But that's how they do it. People that have heard their favorite FM morning shows just evaporate into thin air. The hosts are just gone, and the radio station banks on the fact that you're just gonna forget about them, and it keeps on working. And one of the things I love about this story, Chuck, is that millions of people, literally millions. Of people are pushing back and it's nice to see a bean counting geeky exec eat it every once in a while isn't it because these are well, always the ones that sit in the corner offices and just exercise that guillotine and uh this guy's being dragged into it and i think that he deserves his time in the spotlight not in a good way let, let me let me say something about some of these uh, bean counting executives some of the one of the things they suffer from and, you know, my, my late uh, grandmother, Elizabeth, used to warn me about this. She called envy cancer. She said in the, uh, in the human condition, the number one disease is envy. And many people make mistakes. Many people do the wrong things. Many people do malicious things because they envy other people. Sometimes the envy is so thick and so bad and so everywhere, so omniscient. 
they don't even know it. Now, my grandmother, Elizabeth, didn't use the word omniscient. I'm putting a word into her mouth. But envy is bad. And I'm telling you that some people who sit in corner offices, this has nothing to do with media. This is just about life, but it exists in the media as well. Some people who sit in the corner offices who don't have very much talent really envy those who do. And whoever canned Lisa Laflamme envies her talent. Mm. So we can focus on the gray hair and the 58 and all that kind of stuff that's been said a million times in the last week. It's important. But it's also important to discuss whether, if this is for executives now, are you in a position where you have very, very mediocre talent? Yes, you admire people who have much more talent than you, but for some reason you spend most of your thoughts trying to figure out how to saw them in half. Mm. Is that your problem? Because if that's the life that you live, not only do you affect that particular talent, not only do you piss off the customers, but you're pissing off every other talent in the pool. Every one of them. You're demoralizing people. And if that's what you get out of bed, if that's your purpose in life, getting out of bed every day to find ways to demoralize people, you are a rotten person. And for the persons who hire people like this and keep them in those offices, that's on you. Hmm. Chuck, you know, one of the big, you know, they say about journalists, like you never want to become part of the story. And I would imagine there's a certain level of discomfort here for Lisa Laflamme. I want to use this to change gears, to turn the page, to move our conversation forward. There are a lot of other journalists, in particular women, and in particular women of color, who have, have, have started pushing back on these, these uh, uh, most times anonymymous trolls that have been sending horrific messages. They, they, these women have, have, these journalists have, have, been, have been publishing by way of social media some of the emails they've been receiving, including a so-called hit list. Uh, the content is horrific. We've made an editorial decision. We're not going to share or read from these essentially manifestos on the air. I'm going to be talking to Senator Paula Simons in just a moment, as you know, an award-winning print journalist for many years, about her personal experience in this arena. But what do you make of what you're seeing of the hate, the vitriol, the threats of violence that in particular women in journalism are seeing right now in our country? Well, I talked about the... Uh insecure, uh, mediocre, no-talent executives who, who envy talent and want to make their lives uh, miserable and demoralize people, okay? It demoralizes me as a human being, but specifically as a guy. And sometimes, and I know guys hate it when, when, I, when I say this, but I, you know, I've, been, I've been rewarded magnificently by, by Canadians and Americans all my life for just speaking from the heart, okay? And from the heart, when I see stories like this, it makes me ashamed to be a man. It's, it's the most painful thing in the world to see guys who are so wrapped in insecurity and envy and hatred that they unleash on women, and specifically, most of the time, women of color. I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, just as, as a guy, just as a I mean, how weak can it get? How disgusting can it get? And what is it that one can do with someone who is, who is frankly that effed up? Okay, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to drop f bombs every time we come on the air. But this is a real f bomber for me. Mm. I don't. It, it just to me, the question is like, I mean, it, it can, it can be for many people like a straightforward, cut and dried. We'll go to the police, report it. But we've also seen uh, some of these. Very prominent journalists share their personal experiences in reporting these, for example, to the Ottawa police. And I think most people have been following like Rachel Gilmore at Global News as an example. Uh, I, I'm, I'm doing my best. You're probably noticing here, Chuck, I'm trying not to like name specific people because I'm not trying to, to add to the stress that they're feeling. But Rachel's really done an amazing job, an admirable job of of, 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 of living this out loud and saying, hey, listen, everybody, this is what we're dealing with here. And she shared, she recorded uh, her report, her phone call to Ottawa police, it was infuriating to listen to. I mean, you just get the sense that these aren't taken seriously. People are starting to ask, well, what's the responsibility of newsroom editors and management? And what's the responsibility of the big media corporations? Uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, in your day, and, and maybe we're comparing apples to oranges, but maybe not. I'm sure that you received threatening messages. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, with your hot takes, you infuriated the odd person, and, and I'm sure that you have experience behind the scenes and seeing how some of these things were managed. What's the appropriate response from, from the corporations, from the newsroom managers, and even from law enforcement? 
Well, first of all, I don't I don't discuss uh, security issues uh, sure. publicly, and uh, that's that's been the best advice. But yes, yeah, suffice it to say that um, because of uh, my spontaneity, whatever you want to call it, my, my candor, uh, I do uh, I do piss off uh, some people pretty much every time I open up my mouth or turn on Twitter. Okay, so I'll I'll just st- stipulate that. But as far as what the uh, authorities, whether they're corporate authorities or legal authorities, as in the police. The, the, the thing that bothers me the most is this is also a part of the human condition. Someone has to get killed, okay? And someone will be. Someone has to get killed before they take it really seriously. For whatever reason, once again, we weak human beings, you know, the, the, the best example and the most horrific example is you, you've got an intersection that really needs a traffic light. I mean, it, it just desperately needs a traffic light. Until a child gets killed, mm. authorities don't install the traffic light. They can get all kinds of warnings about close calls from, from, from parents and grandparents and pedestrians, uh, women, men, children, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Until someone gets killed, especially a child, until a child gets killed, they don't install the traffic light. Well, we need some traffic lights. God damn it. I want to talk to you about this conservative leadership race, the federal one. And the conversation uh, may have changed. I mean, this this vote, this election's coming up. And people are soon going to find out who will lead Canada's conservatives, Pierre Polyev, uh, into the next federal election. But in particular, I wanted to showcase one of the new videos that he's released because it's got people talking. And, and I'm going to say, I don't know how well it's going to play with mainstream Canadians. And I don't know how long this style's going to work for them. This one's actually pretty good. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm going to play the first little bit. Here's P- Pierre Polyev's latest vid. Oh, Justin, you're awake. You made it. Have a seat. Have a coffee. You need some. Wakey, wakey time. Thanks very much for taking my invitation to have a little breakfast. I know you're just back from your vacation in Costa Rica. And there's a few things you might not have noticed while you were gone, starting with the price of coffee. It's up 14% in one year. Not just coffee, Justin. Bacon is up 8%. Milk to put in your coffee, it's up 7%. Bread, bread's up 15%. And the butter on the bread, that's up 17%, Justin. Eggs, up 16%. So the average Canadian can't even dream of going on a vacation right now to Costa Rica. They're just dreaming about, well, affording food. Okay, so the video goes on for like five and a half more minutes, and it's the cost of living drum that he's banging. These videos are getting hundreds of thousands of views, and they're resonating with people. Your thoughts? Everyone knows that I'm not a fan of Pierre Polyev, but I've got to, I've got to park that ugly buggy somewhere right now and just focus on the content. The number one bread and butter issue in the land is bread and butter and bacon and milk and eggs. That's the number one issue. Pierre Polyev is talking about the number one issue and he is blaming Justin Trudeau for it. What are the liberals doing about this? I mean, we, we can we can talk about how Pierre Polyev comes across. I mean, I've called him, you know, Skippy the nerd. I've called him all kinds of things. Turns me off in a million ways. He creeps me out, but whatever. Once again, that buggy is parked. Most people only focus on what's actually being said. And he is connecting. As you say, he's resonating with people. And if the liberals don't want to take that seriously, the liberals think that, well, Pierre Polyev is nerdy. He's, you know, stylistically out of whack. He's not cool. You know, whatever. If they want to play that game, that's high school. Mm -hmm. In the major leagues, you've got to stay focused on what really matters to people. And what really matters to people is, yes, their bread and their milk and their bacon and their coffee, those prices have been going up and they haven't been going up by two or 3% like their wages. They've been going up by five and six and seven and 10 and 12%. And if Justin Trudeau doesn't think that he's going to wear some of that bacon, he's absolutely wrong. Mm. So if you're advising the prime minister, if you're advising the, the federal government on a counter communication strategy, I mean, I mean, for the for the most part, it seems like, you know, the liberals are ignoring Pierre Polyev at this point, which is a strategy and oftentimes can be effective. But at some point, 
you've got to put a message in front of Canadians. Wow. And it can't be that inflation is simply not our fault, not our problem. So what yeah, would your no. advice be? Well, for, first of all, here, here's, the, here's the political problem. Uh, you only get one chance to make a first impression. Mm -hmm. And Pierre Polyev has given people a number of impressions now on what the issue is behind inflation. And even though the government can claim that Pierre Polyev is, uh, is spinning, he's not putting things in context, whatever, 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 the point is he is the one characterizing the issue. If I get six months, whether it's in Edmonton or any other market, if I get six months to spend as much as I like in digital media to characterize Ryan Jesperson the way I want to, if I'm his opponent, if I'm his enemy, and Ryan Jesperson does nothing to fight back, I guarantee you, Ryan, that except for maybe some members of your family, most people are going to think there's something wrong with you. Mm. I saw an interesting tweet about this from the prime minister's former principal secretary, Gerald Butts. Uh, he's been on the show before. He says, standing by my earlier take that this style of communications will get old fast uh, for all but the most partisan conservatives. The tone is a lot like that. Nice hair, though, adds they spent a bajillion dollars airing. Pierre Polyev needs it to resonate with a certain group to win the conservative leadership. And then he needs his messaging to start resonating with a bigger group, more diverse politically and otherwise. Right. So are we going to expect or shall we expect to see a change in tone from Pierre Polyev over the next six to 12 months? Feels like a rhetorical question. I, I don't know whether the, the, the tone will change, but, you know, the thing is that this isn't like uh, Justin's not ready and uh, Justin's hair and stuff. Now, this isn't about hair. This is about stuff that is very real for people. You've got a great deal of people in this country who are one paycheck away from poverty. Now, the traditional conventional kind of wisdom is that, well, uh, people who are struggling financially will somehow be open to uh, the NDP's messaging. The NDP's messaging is the most boring on earth. I mean, who at a, a supermarket today uh, who's paying too much for peanut butter and too much for coffee and too much for eggs and milk and bacon and bread? Who on earth there believes that somehow if the NDP were in power, they would snatch so much money away from rich people that it would kind of drift down from the sky uh, into the, the homes, the apartments of people who don't have very much money? Nobody believes that message. Pierre Polyev is actually now talking to working class people who are just a paycheck away from poverty. And that's something the liberals have to take extremely seriously. And you can't just respond to it by going, well, you know, don't like the style of the ad. This isn't about style. This is about substance. This is about bread and butter. Yeah, well said. I do think the track record is relevant, and I would expect to see... And, and we can expect to see attack ads from the liberals aimed at Pierre Polyev. I, I remember him being super critical about CERB and other government incentives that that, you know, I think were aimed. I'm not I'm not carrying water for the prime minister here. I'm just saying, uh, you know, emergency funding that was available to Canadians through the early stages, most especially of covid. Uh, Mr. Polyev was very critical about that. Uh, he, he said that on his watch, he would cancel the ten dollar a day child care program, the national program, and, and had some pretty inflammatory comments about that, about where he thought money should go and to whom he thought money should go and, and, and the wealth creators that should get the money. Um, he doesn't exactly have a track record of looking out for the, the financially or economically marginalized Canadians that are just getting by. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. And so I think he might be painting himself into a bit of a corner on this one, but all that matters right now, if you're his team of strategists led by Jenny Byrne is winning that race. And, and it appears that they're going to do that. And, and at, so I guess at the moment, uh, yeah, at the moment, all that matters is winning the race. But the other thing that really, really does matter is him making this footprint about a substantive issue. Everything you're saying is, is correct. Uh, but the uh, government isn't saying that uh, they're not saying that yet. And I just, I just would, yeah. would urge some caution for, for people who think that uh, Pierre Polyev or for the conservatives to not criticize, to you know, to have criticized Serb and the other programs, those programs were absolutely sacred in keeping this economy alive. But people sometimes have a very, very short memory, and some people 
Some people also have a memory that some people they know, sometimes people in their own families, among their friends, among just acquaintances and sometimes good friends, took advantage of some of those programs. I'm not saying that the program shouldn't have been done. I supported them 100%. But I'm just saying that some of the conservative message about people taking advantage, uh, obviously the conservatives aren't going to uh, talk too much about how some corporations who didn't need the money took advantage. I'll put that aside. But the point is, I'm simply saying that if the government wants to put all its eggs in the basket of, if Pierre Polyev had been a prime minister, uh, we would have uh, become poor. We would have gone into a massive recession because he would have been stingy on benefits, the benefits like CERB and others that kept the country going. If the if the liberals want to invest all their eggs in that basket, I think it's a mistake. We look forward to chatting with you every Monday, Charles. Thanks for this. You're welcome. That's the Titan of Talk. Charles Adler, you can catch him every Monday right here on Real Talk. Senator Paula Simons coming up in just a moment. I want to let you know that our friends at Eden Landscaping know that front yards, especially urban front yards, are challenging. Uh, the intimate space, the cookie cutter layout, let's be honest, the strip of grass, that that single lonely fledgling tree, right, at Eden Landscaping, they, they can help you realize your yard can be so much more than the barely developed minimum. Outdoor spaces are meant to be good for your soul, for our climate, and for our ecosystem. Let Eden Landscaping transform that space into what they call the urban butterfly yard approach. It's a landscape that respects local plant species and important pollinators that need a habitat. You can check out Eden Landscaping's portfolio today. Browse the different styles of landscape design that they execute with perfection at landscapeedmonton.ca. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to let you know that through these, the dog days of summer, when that thermometer is still showing, what do you call it, a thermometer? Is that what normal people call it? I believe it's pronounced thermometer. (laughs) (laughs) 30 degrees? It's blizzard time, baby! You can check out the blizzard of the month. It's coffee crisp. Of course, you've probably got your favorites. Score, Smarties strawberry cheesecake what have you when that moment strikes when you're tapped on the shoulder it's blizzard time we encourage you to visit the dairy queens in palisades nemeo newcastle westmount and baseline road you let them know that real talk sent you and our friends at friesen brothers want to put it on your radar in just about a week from now in just over a week it's going to be september 1st and you know what that means the first of the month every month is 15% off all grocery purchases, $75 or more. That is a huge deal for families. I mean, look, we're talking cost of living. We're talking about cost of groceries. We're talking about all of the things that are pulling at your purse strings. Why not keep as much cash in your pocket as you can? Circle it on your calendar. The first of every month at 16 Friesen Brothers locations across Alberta, 15% off grocery purchases of $75 or more. You can learn all the details at Friesen.com. It's always a total treat to check in with our next guest for many years. Uh, She was a revered columnist in the Edmonton Journal, and of course her columns earning her acclaim, including several national awards. She's since moved on to serve her fellow Canadians in the Senate as an independent senator Representing the Western Bloc of Provinces, it's a thrill to welcome back to the program Senator Paula Simons. It's been a little while, my friend. It has been a while. It's been a while. It's been a it's been a long hot summer. It has been, and I've, I've been following along your social media, in particular your Twitter at politics uh, and 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 i noticed that uh, I, I don't i don't think the reference will be lost in anybody outside of of the western provinces but you've been fringing and uh i know that this is something that you have circled on your calendar every single year how was this year's edition of the edmonton fringe theater festival for you well it's interesting because you know it's certainly not back to what it was pre-covid and i was pretty careful i found myself choosing venues based on how good their hvac was and whether it was a large enough venue that i'd be able to sit at a social distance from people but it was wonderful to be back seeing live theater i saw some very fine shows 
Uh, it was a little bittersweet because it certainly didn't have the same energy and the same variety as a typical fringe. But I was talking to one of the uh, performers in one of the lines who was touring with his one man show. And he said he'd been to other fringes across the country and that Edmonton's was far and away the best this year. He said that in other cities, the fringe just still felt like a ghost of itself. Hmm. So I think we were lucky that we got something approximating a normal fringe here this summer. You and I are a little bit different on social media. I do my best to keep it classy and, and you just do, you just do keep it classy. Um, <laughs> I do. Oh, I, I, I'm glad that the effort is not showing because I, the, 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 perso the persona on Twitter, I think my, my family members would tell you that the, the Twitter Paula is a bit nicer than real Paula. Oh yeah. So we'll, well, we'll, well, I would have we'll liked work to work on sustaining that illusion for everybody. Yeah, well, it's working Senator. And I would have loved to see uh, perhaps then what you would have said to people's, faces who may have criticized you like those online including some pretty prominent voices in can i saw some trolls the trolls were out that were bugging you about you know you were, you took a photo outside at the fringe but you weren't wearing a mask because you were outside not near anybody and and i noticed that you you sort of tried to address their concerns and you said hey to everybody that's concerned i did this i put my mask on inside and i and i and i'll be honest i'm watching this as somebody who's known you for a lot of years and i'm like I didn't understand why you're even giving them oxygen. How do you yeah, approach no, this is, something this is a like very that? Good, this is a very good question. I don't know if you if you have ever shown uh, your little guy the classic Disney version of Alice in Wonderland in which she says, she has a song in which she sings, I give myself very good advice, but I very seldom follow it. <laughs> um, and so my advice always is to people, don't feed the trolls, don't engage, you're only, uh, you're only... Uh, elevating them, you know, exposing their tweets, you know, they've got nine followers and you respond, if you clap back, then, you know, my 65,000 followers get to see Mr. Nine Follower Guy. Uh, I don't know why I did it. You know, I guess at a certain point, I just got exasperated at this, somehow this notion that it was wicked and elitist of me as a senator from Alberta to go to the Fringe Festival, that somehow that this was skiving off work. Oh. when all kinds of politicians go to all kinds of summer festivals all the time and i started to wonder hmm is elitist in this section in this sentence um doing a lot of work to be um to mean that i because i think that you know the show i went to see that day that i was talking about was by darren hoggins guys in disguise Brilliant. you know it was it, it wasn't really a drag show it was but it was a show of you know uh, of men playing female roles I mean, it was it was not a it was not a typical drag show. Right. Crack, cracks in the mirror. Uh, but. I don't know. You just you just get exasperated. And, um, you know, when I had hundreds and hundreds of people telling me, because obviously the question about why I'm not wearing a mask is not a good faith question. You know, because then as soon as I posted a picture of myself in the theater with a mask, people were like, why are you wearing a mask? Don't you know COVID is over? And, you know, I'm very proud to role model the fact that I'm still masking when I'm in public spaces, uh, when I'm up close to people in crowds, when I'm inside a shop or, uh, you know, uh, any business that I frequent or, or theater or on an airplane, obviously. I, you know, I think we need to still normalize mask wearing. The numbers of, of people who are still catching COVID, ending up in hospital, it's not like there's been a, a plummeting I know we'd like to believe it's over. It's not over. It's not over. Numbers and don't lie. Yeah. When the kid when the kids go back to school, uh, and the university students go back to school, um, there's going to be another spike in cases. That doesn't mean I think that we need to all hide in our houses, but I think uh, I'm I'm more comfortable in a mask. And if my wearing a mask and showing that publicly helps other people to feel more comfortable. Uh, then I'm very proud to do that. And I don't think anybody that wears a mask needs to answer to anybody about why they're wearing a mask. I, I thought it was kind of hilarious. Number one, you were getting piled on for being elitist. And I'm not sure that any uh, event that you attend where the ticket is $16 can qualify you uh, as an elite in any context. But I also think it's fascinating that people wonder, like, you know, you're out and about in the community, you know, you're, you're presumably enjoying yourself mixing and mingling with members of the public in, in, in the middle of August when when, you know, nothing's happening in Ottawa for the most part. Uh, you're not required to be in Ottawa. You're not skipping out on work. But, you know, the same critics, Paula, would pile on you if you weren't. I should call you senator. If you weren't out in the community, they'd pile on you if you weren't out talking to people. So you, you can do no right. 
And uh, I think at, at some point, I don't know, I'm not giving you advice. I'm not a senator. I probably never will be. But but at some point, you just got to uh, beat it. You know what I mean? Beat it. No. No, I mean, and that's normally what I do. I mean, I hit the mute button. Yeah. Uh, I very rarely block people because I do believe that I'm a public figure and that the work I do on Twitter, for the most part, should be public. And so, you know, there are certain egregious individuals that I have fantasized about blocking, but I don't. <laughs> um, you know, if if I mute, if you think I may have muted you, you may be right. Uh, and that's why I do mute people because my my capacity to restrain myself from clapping back is sometimes. Uh, insufficient yes yes but, but you know I, I i also do think that it is an opportunity to explain to people because i think a lot of people don't really understand the ins and outs of how the senate works so i mean i've had people ask me in good faith people who aren't trolls say to me oh i'm surprised to see you in edmonton for the summer mm. aren't you know shouldn't you be in ottawa i think it's important that everybody understands that the house of commons and the senate traditionally in canada do not sit in the summer and so if you see your MPs, whether they're conservative, liberal, or NDP, out and about in your community, they are also not skipping work. Uh, MPs and senators during the summer traditionally spend time in their communities meeting with, I hate that word, stakeholders. Uh, it's such a jargony word. I meet with people. Um, and I meet with people, you know, I haven't only been to the fringe. I've been all, you know, not not as much around the province as I might have been uh, you know, the first summer I was a senator without COVID, but, you know, I was in Innisfail for Innisfail Pride. I was at Lac St. Anne for the Lac St. Anne pilgrimage. I mean, I, I, I get out and about, and that is part of my job. It's part of the job of every senator and every MP. So you will see us out and about in the summer months. That's part of being a politician in Canada. Mm. Uh, and, you know, there's, if I, people are, oh, you should get back to your office in Ottawa. Well, th there's, it's the Senate's role to study government legislation. And so we, you know, there are some senators who propose smaller bills of their own, and that's allowed. But primarily, it's our job to, to watch over government legislation. And until government legislation comes before us, you know, you, you sort of can't put the cart before the horse. So I will be taking part in Senate public hearings in Edmonton, uh, on September 8th, when the Senate's uh, Standing Committee on Human Rights is coming on a Western tour. I'm not a member of that committee, but I've been asked to sub in because the hearings will take place in Edmonton. And those are hearings on Islamophobia. And so I've been really involved in helping to set up those hearings and, and find witnesses. And then the week after that, even though the Senate's not sitting yet, I will be in Ottawa because I am a member of the Standing Senate Committee on Transportation and Communications. And we're going to be meeting early to do some intensive hearings on Bill C-11. And then the Senate begins sitting uh, September 20th. And from that point, I'll be back and forth to Edmonton on a weekly basis. Hmm. Um, I, I, di I didn't lead with the lead here because uh, I, I wanted to check in with you and see how you're doing and ask you how your fringe was. But but I want to ask fr you about two things fringe, in particular. Fringe was great. It was, yeah. it was strange. It's always good. Yeah, and you know, this year I wasn't I wasn't a playwright, I wasn't a critic, I wasn't a stage mom. I just got to be a civilian. And yeah, there you nice go. Change. Sometimes it's nice. A, a civilian who also happens to be a senator and had to deal with some of the flack. But I digress. Uh, want to talk green onion cake? Yeah, <laughs> green onion cake, the the Edmonton staple. Um, I want to ask you about uh, a couple of things that are, that are of course, uh, very serious. Um, in particular, some of the threats and 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 the horrific messages that that women in particular, uh, women of color uh, that work in journalism, that do amazing work in journalism in Canada are facing. It's becoming more and more and more of a prominent story, unfortunately, because it's continuing, because a so-called hit list has, has been released, and it, it's brutal. Uh, and then there's the Lisa Laflamme story, which, which people just can't stop talking about for, for obvious reasons. I mean, her videos you know, viewed more than 4 million times over the weekend on her Twitter page talking about her unceremonious dismissal departure whatever you want to call it from from ctv news and, and of course you worked many years in journalism uh as a, as a newspaper columnist a reporter and author and i'm just wondering first of all on the on the lisa laflam story how how you're wrapping your mind around it if you're at liberty to comment as a senator i never know with these types of things paula well you know i don't know lisa myself i mean uh i never worked with her i i i don't think i've ever been interviewed by her uh, she was obviously a beloved and highly respected figure in Canadian journalism. And, you know, it's a rare thing. The CBC moved away uh, from having a one-host nightly news show after Peter Mansbridge retired. 
And I think although the the four people that they chose, and I think now that now they've gone back to having just Adrian Arsenault, they kind of broke faith. CTV was sort of the last remaining network with a flagship anchor that everybody could name and whose newscasts were still appointment television for an older demographic. So I've learned over years as a journalist that whenever there's a personnel issue in the news, there's always more than we in the public know about. I mean, it's like an iceberg. We see the tip. There's always something off. There's always office politics going on below the surface. And I don't know enough about why she was let go to comment on that. That's fair. Were I giving advice to a major network, I might suggest to them that this is not the best time to to break faith with their older core audience and and get rid of somebody who is a household name and a household face for whom people feel this intense sense of loyalty. And I've actually really been, you know, sort of touched, that's the right word for it, by seeing how many people have been so deeply upset by what happened to Lisa LaFleur. Mm. I also have to say, I mean, now that I'm a senator, perhaps I have a different sense of what old is. I mean, Lisa <laughs> is... 58! This is 58. I. That's basically, you know, I, I think I'm... Am I fifty six or fifty seven? I'm fifty seven. Um, I'll I'll be I'll be fifty eight um, next month. Um, sometimes I forget. Like I I tell people, you know, I'm fifty four. It's not actually a lie. It's just fifty four was a good age. I like that one. Um, but you know, is fifty eight old? Certainly not when you're sitting in the Senate. It's not old. Uh, is it the fact? I mean, I think most women our age wish that we had hair. That looked like that. I mean, people people pay a lot of money for that look in salons. So the idea that somehow um, her gray hair should have been a problem. I mean, I, I'm kind of lucky. This is this is mostly all me. Is that au natural? Uh, is that right? That, yeah, there there are a couple foils in here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I I have I have good hair genes. This this is this is thanks to to to, to my booby to my grandma Rose who had a full head of dark hair when she died at 92. Uh. But but you know, I mean, it's not actually a marker for age, right? I mean, no. it, it. I mean, some women, some women go silver in their in their thirties, and it looks fantastic on them. And I think during during COVID, I mean, I was coloring my hair, and I grew my color out during COVID because because that was sort of the the thing to do. What's well, a big trend uh, now? I, there's there's entire yeah. Instagram accounts that are you know that, that that for the most part are women, but you know I mean I'm sure that some men are doing it too. But are like they're they're like going gracefully gray, or they have like all the different names for. It. I think it's fantastic, and and I don't want to I don't want to go in a weird direction talking about Lisa Laflamme and like making it about her appearance and things like that. But but if I can just say like in one sentence and I'll leave it at that, I think she is a huge talent. She's beloved by her audience. She's very capable. She's had a celebrated career. And and quite frankly, I, I think she's stunning. And so I just like, to me, I mean, again, yeah, there's business decisions, there's ways to do it, but I just think like you, whether or not you're yeah. shuttling an anchor out and she had 11 years on the national desk. It's, it's, it's a great run. I'm not saying, I mean, if I was calling the shots, which I'm not, wouldn't let her go, but I sure wouldn't have done it like that. No, and, it's, you know, I mean, y- you you and I have been in this industry a while. You've mm. been on both sides yep. of this question. Yeah. Um. When you when somebody leaves a, a high profile position, who's had a bond of trust with the audience, um, I think it's it, it's a powerful bond of trust that news anchors and radio hosts develop with their audiences. And so you 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 mess with that at your peril if you're in management. But I also think that for women in television, this is not a new issue. Uh, I, you know, I, I was a print reporter. It didn't matter what I looked like for the most part, if I could, you know, get myself through the, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the biennial, uh, mugshot shooting incident. Um, Mm. I didn't have to worry about being pretty to write the news, but television does have these demanding standards of what people are supposed to look like. Yeah. And there have been lots of great women journalists that you and I know personally uh, in Edmonton who've been on the receiving end of that, uh, most of whom have gone on to brilliant careers in other places with managers who weren't so uh, narrow-minded about what constitutes an attractive woman. 
nicely said. Uh, the reason that we originally, I mean, um, first of all, we would reach, reach out to you anytime. The door is always open to have you on the show. But uh, but I, I really appreciate it in the in in the context of what's a, a really troubling national news story right now. And, th- and these are the threats that that journalists are receiving, in particular women, and and most specifically women of color or religious minorities or however you want to sort of interpret this. Um, you you shared. A uh, personal story, so to speak, um, a personal account of back when you were a newspaper columnist and and you were no stranger to threats. And you talked about the the support or at least the steps that were taken by your newsroom. And and I and I thought that our audience would benefit from from getting your take on this. You're obviously a a measured and rational person who has received messages. I would imagine many, perhaps more than you will divulge to us, from irrational people who are not measured and who are probably unpredictable and you never know what no, it, folks it, it's it's a spooky thing so i want to say first of all i feel a little bit awkward stepping into this space because i'm a little bit out of the fray and i have all the privilege and protection that comes with being a senator and so some of the young women journalists women i really admire from all across the country uh you know uh are have been subjected in the last few weeks to what appears to be a coordinated, organized campaign of hate, which is more terrifying than one random person sending you one random email. This is, I think, the thing that is particularly disquieting, is that this does not to appear to be, you know, some one-off, unbalanced person in your home community. These are These are high-profile women journalists TV, radio, and print from all across the country who are being bombarded by absolutely grotesque hate mail. Hate mail that is cleverly phrased often so that the threats are not overt. Right. So that when these women have gone to the police, the police have said, well, you know, there isn't an overt threat. Well, that's because the language is carefully chosen to fly just under the radar of where the police might be compelled to take action. Mm. But I think, I mean, this is a campaign of uh, emotional terrorism, and it's fine to shrug it off and say, oh, these are they, these are blowhards, they're just trying to scare them and upset them, they'd never really act on it. Uttering threats is a criminal offense. Um, you know, trying to extort someone by menaces is a criminal offense. Uh, and harassment is a criminal offense. And so I think we need to be much more serious in a campaign like this that is clearly designed to intimidate and clearly designed to frighten people, that we not just shrug it off and say, oh, this is just like, you know, just like it used to be in the olden days. And I and I really want to stress, I absolutely received threats. Um, usually, I mean, this some of the some of the more frightening ones predated the internet. Um, I never experienced the kind of serious threats that say someone like Kim Bolan from the Vancouver Sun, uh, one of my absolute heroines in Canadian journalism, Kim covered um, political extremist groups and uh, drug gangs and things in Vancouver uh, in the 1990s and 2000s and needed round the clock police protection because the threats against her were not just a bunch of I was going to say a word I can't say because I'm a dignified you senator. Can say, yeah, you are a dignified um, senator. I was going to say a real talk. It was, it was, was, was going to start with an A, and it was going to be a whole lot of a word. <laughs> okay, but, okay. Um, I think uh, I got know, it. Right, you know, so, I mean, Kim received authentic death threats. I mean, mm. they they weren't they weren't just blowing smoke. They They're, meant it. They were credible, so to speak. They, yeah. were, they, were, they were credible death threats from people who were organized killers. So, you know, that that you have to take seriously in an entirely different way. The threats I received were always, you know, one one or two we turned over to the police. The rest were more what you'd call ill-wishing. And those are still the ones I get primarily as a senator, are the ones that say, you know, you're not going to live long enough to collect your pension. Well, you know, I may or I may not. Do you turn that over to the police? Is that a threat? Well, it's a veiled threat. Yeah. I mean, the other problem is how we manage things on social media. Uh, I reported a tweet to Twitter the other day that was sent to me, and it was a picture of sort of silhouettes of women. not So not my face, but like a shadow shape of a woman 
and another woman and another woman being killed and then cartoon blood rushing out of them. And I don't normally report things to Twitter because normally it's a waste of my time, but I thought that was I thought that was a serious enough one to report and I reported it and they were like, no, no, that doesn't break any of our rules because it's not a threat against you. Right. And with Twitter, if you've if you filed a report recently, you'll see that, you know, they are now increasing their actions if you if you threaten someone on the basis of their race or religion or their gender identity, like if they're trans. But they don't seem to respond to just misogyny in the same way. And many of the threats that women receive are not about their race or, you know, their sexuality. They're just about the fact that they are women. So, you know, I mean, I get a constant litany of things. I'm, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age. I'm not that thin. I, you know, I get fat shaming all the time. Um, I get lots of people making jokes about my sexuality, assuming assuming or pretending that they think that I'm gay. I'm not. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, as, as Seinfeld would say. It just <laughs> happens to be not the case. Um, you know, uh, lots of people uh, suggesting that I'm trans. I'm not. Again, not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, I, I happen to be a boring, cisgendered, straight, white woman. Um, you know, I get anti-Semitic things because I'm Jewish on my dad's side. You know, and unfortunately, I think this is the point of the Twitter thread uh, that I wanted to make. I've spent 30 years in public life shrugging off those threats, yeah. saying, oh, well, you know, I'm I'm going to show how tough I am. I'm never going to let them see me sweat. I'm certainly never going to let them see me cry. Um, I will be one of the guys. I will laugh these things off. And I think at a certain point, I may have done an injustice, not just to myself, but to every woman who came after me. Because, you know, I'm trying to think how many young women I counseled in the Edmonton Journal when I was mentoring them to say, oh, you just, you just need to grow a thick skin. You just need to ignore it. And I'm kind of proud of the fact that these young journalists of my daughter's generation are just saying, nope, nope, we're not having it. But, but you know, and I, I don't wish to stray into indelicate territory here. Oh, say whatever. Yeah, let's go there. I mean, you know, as a manager, how hard it is to protect the women in your employ. Yeah. And, you know, what are you supposed to do? Um, because I had great male managers. You know, I don't want to throw them under the bus because lots of them were fantastic. But, you know, their basic response was, well, then maybe don't be on Twitter so much or, you know, just block people. And at a certain point, that's not enough. And I think I think in newsrooms all across Canada, large and small, we need to have some serious discussions about what newsroom culture does to back women up. Yeah. And, you know, and to return us to the Lisa Latham situation, uh, sometimes it's not very much. And the expectation is, I think. And I think has been for the 30 years that I've been in public life and the 20 years I've been on social media, is that it's up to me as an individual to manage the social media threats and the nasty emails. And I think at a certain point, um, and again, I don't wish to I don't wish to poke a sore spot, but but you know from bitter experience that sometimes uh, media management doesn't always stand up for women or they're worried because you, you also don't want to fall into the trap of being the male savior like yo i'm going to be the knight on oh, the white man. horse and i'm going to protect the poor little ladies who work for me from the big bad trolls because women don't want that either no. so so it's it's really tricky let me let me first of all say that it, it doesn't have to be indelicate and it's fine for and and like i'm happy to talk about it um, yeah, I mean, like we, we've had there, there's a reason why I think that the, this story is really resonating with us. Right. Uh, in particular, on this show and why we're saying, like, we're going to shine a light on this. And, and and it's been interesting for me to see even Paula, like I, you know, I was I was communicating with our audience earlier saying, like, you know, we, we've we've we had lined up interviews and I don't want to use people's names. They don't deserve that. And it's not fair. But like some interviews that we had uh, lined up to talk about this with people who have been targeted or are, are now they've, they've exercised their right to say, we well, actually we're. We're not going to do interviews on this anymore because it's getting so bad uh, yeah. that, that they don't want to keep talking about it. And that, to me, has been a really big wake up call. So so here with with real talk and relay and then bigger picture uh, with talk shows, uh, you know, talk shows versus newscasts, because there's a different dynamic there. You know, shows called real talk. Like, how do you live up to that? How do you protect your staff? How do you respond to critics? How do you manage social media? I mean, it's it's all it's not uncharted territory, but but it seems to me to be 
ramping up and to be forcing itself, this issue to be forcing itself in front of everybody. And it, and it demands our diligence and, and our full attention. And I just like, I even, I even look at some of the responses, you know, I've even, you know, I, I just comment on something on, on Twitter or what have you. I'll say, you know, some, someone will, you know, I, 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 I mentioned Rachel Gilmore at Global News because she's been very open about what she's been dealing with. And she's been yeah. sharing a lot of the messages she's been receiving. And they're horrific. And I'll respond like, you know, brutal or, or you know, we've got your back or, or that like something benign, like just something like a little thing. And then people will sort of pile on the comment and, and I'm and I'm hearing from people. You know, fellow Canadians that are saying things like, I remember one woman's response to me was something like, you know, you journalists have been, you know, you've been dividing Canadians through COVID and you've been misleading people with your, you know, and, and I know you're going to roll your eyes, Paula, but, like, you know, with your, your Trudeau funded media elite one, you know, whatever. And then, you know, these people, these otherwise you would assume sort of ordinary people that meet with their families around the campfire circle on the weekends are, are saying like, you know, you've got it coming or I hope you enjoy what you've, you know, you deserve whatever you, yeah. and I'm sitting there going like, do people honestly, I mean, is, is this like a loud, you know, percentage of 1% or is this like a relatively significant element of our society that has this like venomous anger well, I mean, for journalists? I think to be blunt that post convoy, it's, it's escalated. I mean, there, there, you know, there was always a baseline of that in my correspondence over all the years since the convoy it's gotten so much worse. Yeah. I mean, since COVID, it's gotten worse. And then the convoy escalated things. And it's hard for me to tell because sometimes I go through my Twitter feed, I go through my emails in my Senate inbox, and and I despair for the human condition. And then I have to remind myself that I think this is a small percentage of Canadians, but it is a growing percentage of Canadians. And I'm afraid that as more and more people hear people saying these things publicly, they're emboldened. Or they're convinced, you know, that that somehow this is this is true. That you know that that the media, that the government, that you know, there's always somebody who's responsible for whatever misery and fear they have in their lives. And the brutal truth, my friends, is that we are still in the midst of a global pandemic, the likes of which our generations have never known. Yeah, this is an unprecedented medical crisis in modern times. And we're still coping with how to deal with it. The high inflation that we're seeing, which is absolutely real and is absolutely devastating to, to, you know, to, to families who are trying to put groceries on the table, is a real phenomenon. It's not caused by one politician in one country. I saw today that in Britain, they're forecasting an inflation rate of over 18%. Yeah. I mean, you know, and part of that is, is Brexit. Part of that is that you know the government in Great Britain right now is in is in a bit of a you know they they're in a leadership uh, transition and maybe don't have their eye on the ball but lots of this has to do with global drought with the war in Ukraine that is having an effect on energy prices with supply chain issues that are still being felt because of covid yeah and you know we have significant problems in our country to demonize one politician, one party um, is not a response. And I'm not a liberal. I, you know, I, I'm not a member of Justin Trudeau's party. I'm an independent senator. I've never been a liberal. But, you know, the amount of venom that's being spewed towards um, this prime minister and this prime minister's cabinet is, is horrifying and unprecedented. As senators, we get some of the backsplash of that. To be honest, I probably don't get as many threats as a lot of other politicians because senators have a lower public profile. Mm. I mean, I put my head above the parapet probably more than is necessary. Uh, but, you know, when I joined the Senate, I really wanted to take my skills as a journalist and transpose them and say to people, here's a really important part of Canadian governance that most Canadians don't know anything about. So I took a, you know, I took a vow. Doesn't that sound grand? Um, but, you know, I, I, I said to myself, self, you should use your Twitter and your Facebook and your, you know, your social media smarts and your, your and your writing skills such as they are to teach people more about the Senate. So I sort of elevated the profile of the Senate and of myself. But I can tell you that the threats I've received are probably nothing compared to what 
uh, Justin Trudeau or for that matter, Jason Kenney have received. Uh, you know, I don't know what Jason Kenney's uh, security situation is right now, uh, probably a, a bit better than it was at, at the height of things. But there is a lot of anger out there. There's a lot of anger and a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty about what is happening in our world as we as we battle the pandemic that has not released its grip upon us, as we look at what is happening in Eastern Europe and wonder what might happen if Russia accidentally or accidentally on purpose uh, uh, commits an act of aggression in some place like Poland or Estonia. I mean, what will that what will that mean for the world? And so, of course, people are frightened and of course people are angry and that's right across the political spectrum and it's really easy to scapegoat uh politicians and it's really easy to scapegoat journalists i mean there's that old expression kill the messenger and when your journalists are reporting accurately on what's happening in the world and the news they bring you is frightening uh then people have a tendency to lash out i'm really glad that you 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 mentioned the the word fear because I think so much of this has to do with fear. I think so much of the anger has to do with fear. And as, as you and I are sitting here talking, I'm just, I'm, I'm Googling the Yoda quote because I didn't want to blow it. But, uh, you know, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. And I think there's some wisdom there. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that a lot of, you know, I'm trying to be, empathetic and compassionate when people write to me i think at a time of such uncertainty and such chaos and such randomness there's a temptation to buy into conspiracy theories because at least they provide you know sort of rebar they provide a narrative that people can you know they'd almost rather believe in some boogeyman like the you know the world economic forum is destroying the world than to admit the fact that this pandemic and the climate emergency that we're in, these are complicated systems that do not yield themselves easily to simple human solutions. And at a time when there's a lot to be worried about, it's not surprising that some people seek solace in a simpler narrative that allows them to feel empowered and allows them to feel part of a community and allows them, you know, I mean, everybody wants to think that they're Luke Skywalker. Everybody wants to think that they're, you know, that they're Frodo and, and Gandalf and Strider going off to fight Sauron. I mean, the thing is, the world doesn't come in simple binary black and whites like that. Yeah. And these are really complicated problems. And they're not, they, they, they don't yield themselves to simplistic solutions. I feel like my heart is just full every time we talk and I so I'm serious and I I just really appreciate your perspective senator and as always we appreciate your candor and uh and your availability on uh on on, on your off time and your summer hours No it's uh, it's, it's not it's not off I am <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying I'm to working, get working, working. On again. I mean I just I just so that people know I mean this week uh to, uh I'm going to the there's a big short line rail conference, which I'm attending in Edmonton as a member of the Senate Transportation Committee. I'm doing um, a prison visit this week with my colleague, Kim Pate, uh, a senator who's dedicated her life to prison reforms and will be visiting uh, the women's prison in Edmonton. Wow. Um, you know, so we, I, I, I try to, you know, I try to do some useful things every day um, so that I'm, you know, earn, earning my keep. Well, and this is but amazing. Like, I'm glad you're on here talking about it. People people get a better idea of what senators and a, maybe a reminder of what elected representatives do and how much time it takes. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I would never seek elected office is, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm on, on the beach with my family this last weekend and I'm scrolling through my Instagram and I see, like, every politician I know is like, I was proud to attend this and bring greetings on behalf of this and I was happy to knock on the doors here and to do this and i was just like that is my worst nightmare uh it's it's a huge commitment and i respect the hell of people who do it so um thanks for making time for us all right take care ryan all right that's senator paula simons an independent senator 
out of Alberta. You can give her a follow on, on Instagram. You can give her a follow on Twitter. Of course, we link to her account from our official account at Real Talk RJ every I just single did. morning. You just followed her? I just, I'm a big, big you, Senator you, fan. Now. Paul Simons is like, I don't know, I've, 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 a lot of times like you'd read her columns back in the day and just be like, yeah, what she said. Yeah. You know, not all the time. And I'm sure that she, you know, probably wrote the odd column where she might go, well, it was based on how I felt at the time or whatever. That's the thing about, first of all, the difference between radio and print is like Mm -hmm. you put it in print and it's like, it's there. It's like there. Radio (laughs) just like evaporates, or at least it used to, into the ether. But uh, I really appreciated her perspective on that. Amazing. yeah, Yeah. You can let us know. How you feel about what you heard from Senator Simons, what you heard from Charles Sadler. We value your opinions very much. Talk at RyanJesperson.com. I don't want the show to wrap without asking you. <laughs> I asked you to roll them. Your eyes are getting like, I wish people could see right now. Your eyes just closed. You have this moment of like serenity now. I said, I said, Johnny, can you roll the, the Pierre Polyev breakfast video? You want to hit it again? No, no, no. It's okay. For, <laughs> for Charles, it's a, the video is very well done. Like give him credit where it's due. The video is very well done. Um, I but I could probably think- come up with my own breakfast metaphors on whether or not there's substance or whether or not you're, you know, whether or not it's just carbo loading, with em- empty calories. But I digress. But I couldn't ignore the expression on your face as you were watching that video. How does it make you feel? Well, yeah, I was I was just going to comment on saying how much I love the senator because she's level headed and she uses common sense. But then people say that about Pierre, too. And watching the video, I'm just like. Does this guy literally? He must have writers now. Of course, I don't think he's this witty. Right? Of course, he got the whole thing is a big production. Yeah, I don't begrudge him for that. I mean, he must have done a dress rehearsal. Wants to be prime minister, right? Yeah. I'm wondering how did they get all the other? Did they close down the diner because the people in the background are like not even paying any attention? No, I think it's like Like when you don't know, he probably like the senator said when you watch Seinfeld. There's just kind of people in the back, like (laughs) they're not actually talking; they're just (laughs) moving their mouths. But yeah, I mean, it's. He's on, to, he's on to something. He is, but he's where, on to something with where's the substance? But like, what are you going to do about it? It's like watching a TV show. You know, how is it the federal government's fault? What did the federal government do wrong? And what would you do differently? Exactly. And, I and don't hear a lot of that. Intelligent people will start to ask those questions like, well, what's your plan, mm-hmm. man? Well, his uh, plan is you know, to fire a bunch of people, which doesn't fix much. Yeah, fair. So. Talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you can get in touch with us. Of, of course, you know our hashtag, Real Talk RJ, is also one we keep an eye on. If you're posting on Instagram, posting on Twitter, we encourage you to use it. Oh, on TikTok as well. Ooh. John, do they use hashtags on TikTok? I think they, you know, <laughs> I think the kids do. You can find Real Talk Don't on TikTok. As well. I'm just having fun. But you know the Real Talk RJ hashtag is powered by our friends at Park Power that want to remind you, of course, right now that you have a choice. Uh, If you're listening from our home province of Alberta, where you get your internet, your electricity, your natural gas, you can choose the provider that's best for you. Why not go with the team at Park Power? They're friendly, they're local, they're family owned, and if you bundle all three services together, internet, natural gas, and electricity, you can save big dough on admin costs. Plus, they'll put $70 in your pocket if you bring your business over. Use the promo code 2022-REALTALK at parkpower.ca. $70 off your first bill with Park Power. Also, a big shout out to the Covenant Foundation Lottery 2022. You know, for 160 plus years, Covenant Health has made a huge difference for patients and their loved ones, in particular at the forefront of technological innovation, a leader in palliative and urgent care. For the last 30 years, the Covenant Foundation Lottery has played a big role in making a difference for people in their care. You can help them prepare for the future. You can help fund state-of-the-art equipment, enhanced care spaces, and innovative approaches to care at the Misericordia and Grey Nuns Hospitals by buying your tickets today. You're going to want to check out covenantfoundationlottery.ca or call 1-888-944-2774. That's 1-888-944-2774. There's a Tesla Model S up for grabs. That bonus prize deadline is coming up quick, September 1st. And the grand prize, a 2.2 million dollar dream home. Absolutely stunning. You can tour the house, that dream home today at covenantfoundationlottery.ca. Well, our first show every week, our friends at Kubi Energy, you can get your free solar quote today, by the way, at kubienergy.ca. They, they give us a reason to focus on the positive, to find the silver linings, to fill our buckets, to, to, to take that optimism on a Monday and carry it through the week. We call it positive reflections. 
And we're so grateful for the submissions that we receive from you. But every once in a while, John and I, we, we decide to make it a little bit more personal. And I, I wanted to make mine personal okay, today. Yeah. You know, for the last week, our family and I, we headed down to Sylvan Lake in central Alberta, about halfway between Calgary and Edmonton-ish. And it had been a while since we were in Sylvan Lake. And I wanted to give a big shout out to the people of central Alberta, in particular, the folks out at Sylvan Lake. They have done a marvelous job with overhauling their Lakeshore Drive area. John, when's the last time you were down there? Have you, have you been down to Sylvan Lake? I haven't last been little there while? in years. Man, actually. they used to have, it was the strip. Everybody loved driving the cars, course, especially yeah. the classic cars and the Harleys and all that jazz down Lakeshore Drive. But they diverted the road back coming up on 10 years ago, and they put in a lot more park space, a lot more green mm. space, and a lot more amenities for families. And wow, has it ever paid off. We had such a wonderful time out there on the beach, visiting with friends. That's our Wyatt Rudy. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see him with the Friesen Brothers, yellow watermelon, yellow watermelon. in there, having an absolute blast in one of Alberta's most beautiful lakes. We had a chance to catch up with people we hadn't seen for a while. And while we were down there as well, the 20th edition, that's Relay's general manager, by the way, Katie Cook Chivers, holding our little guy. That's Noah. Uh, Noah's able to finally meet some friends out there outside yeah. on the beach, getting a little sand between his toes for the first time ever. But the 20th annual Jazz on the Beach, the Sylvan Lake Jazz Festival was mm -hmm. down there. It's oh. free. They make it free. It draws people to the community. It's You don't have to get a ticket for it. Absolutely amazing stuff. Some of the best musicians in Western Canada out there playing. Had just a marvelous time. And I wanted to take this opportunity to remind you that there's no time like the present to get outside, to fill your lungs with that fresh air, to catch up with friends, maybe over a campfire or a walk on the beach or maybe at your local dog park. And a big shout out to the communities like Sylvan Lake that prioritize those spaces, that make it possible for families and friends and individuals for that matter to gather and to hit that reset button so they can start their next week off right. Shout out to all of you in Sylvan Lake. You can send us your positive reflections presented by Kubi Energy with an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Coming up on tomorrow's broadcast, we're looking forward to connecting with national political commentator Andrew Coyne. We'll take a look at the future of conservative politics and politics in general. Of course, the conservative leadership race plays into that. Uh, Andrew was with me at that Center Ice event a couple of weeks ago. We talked to you about that. Who's speaking out for the folks in the middle, the so-called mainstream voters? He had some really interesting takes through the conference, and I thought that the real talk audience might want to hear him. So that's exactly where we'll go. Make it a great Monday, friends, and we'll talk to you soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive Producer, Josh Dunford. Technical Producer, John Hicks. General Manager, Katie Cook Chivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepard. Website Design, Mike Johnston. VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandi Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a Relay Project. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.